What are I2S and DSD I have also mentioned in my DAC and ADC videos? How about SPDIF? Why is USB audio said to be the best input? How do jitter and reclocking fit in this? There is a connection between all of these and we will start with the PCM and DSD and build from there. I will try to give enough information to understand the concepts, but still keep it high enough level not to dig too much into technical details. And we start with an analog signal picked up by a sensor such as a microphone and we need to digitize this signal. We don't talk about AD conversion too much here, but just the concept of, of digitizing an analog signal. So we can think of it as slicing the signal in magnitude and in time. So here the horizontal lines are the magnitude slicing, the vertical lines are the time slicing and the blue circles are the sampling points. So now we would get a stream of data here, 8, 9, 11, 13, 14, 15 and so on. So 4 bit resolution and this is updated at the sample rate. And this is basically how PCM signal, pulse code modulation signal is formed. This example of course is very low resolution here, but um, the most common is CD audio, 16 bits, 44.1 kilohertz. And of course now we have a lot higher resolution and sample rates. And here is another illustration of the PCM signal, how the analog signal is digitized. And just a note of this rounding error. So for example here, the difference between the white signal and the green steps or here how the blue circles are not exactly matching the red. The digitized signal never matches the analog completely and that's quantization noise, which is setting the limit basically for the dynamic range we can have. And next, a DSD, Direct Stream Digital. It was originally developed for Super Audio CD and it's a form of pulse density modulation. It can be a bit more difficult to explain, but it uses a delta sigma modulation, which is used in AD and DA conversion. If you look at the DSD signal compared to PCM, so it's switching between just two values and the average of the, the signal corresponds to the analog signal. When we have the 16-bit signal at 44.1 kHz sample, right, for example, we start oversampling the signal. It means that we can achieve the same resolution as in 16 bits by reducing the bit depth while increasing the sample rate. When we do this many times, we eventually we get from 16 bits to just one bit and the sample rate has gone from 44.1 kilohertz to 2.8 megahertz. This was of course very much simplified explanation. Noise shaping is very important when doing this uh, delta sigma modulation that you're increasing the sample rate and pushing the noise above audio band. Here is another illustration between the PCM and DSD compared to the analog signal. So yeah, with PCM you effectively give a value at sample rate, what is the signal magnitude. And in DSD you just switch quickly between the two values and the average represents what the signal value in analog signal. So we can take an example. Let's say we want to represent a value 0.75 volts in one volt range. In the PCM signal, take the closest code to 0.75 volts and just keep that static. With DSD, it will toggle between 1 volt and 0 volts in a way that it's 75% of the time in 1 volt signal and 25% at 0 volts and just switch fast enough that you wouldn't get any artifacts. If you think it like that way, which one of these would you rather have your hi-fi audio signal in? This PDM, which DSD effectively is, is a kind of cheap and dirty way of doing digital audio. It's used when you cannot afford a proper conversion, it would need to be very cheaply, such as uh, digital microphones. So why do we use this in hi-fi then? Well, the catch is that modern DA and AD converters, they do this anyway. So you have this uh, sigma delta modulation inside the converter happening anyway, even if you put in 32-bit PCM signal. So the argument is that when you use a DSD signal, you are just doing this before the converter already, while it would do it anyway. It's worth mentioning though that all kind of processing, EQ, even volume control, 
any DSP, everything is done in PCM signal. So um, you cannot just maintain the DSD signal throughout the whole signal chain. Okay, we've talked about how the data is formed in PCM and DSD signal, but a real world signal has always two sides of it. It's the magnitude, the data value and time. So to transfer the data, we need to transfer the data value, but also the correct timing for those values. And that's why all real-time signals have data and clock. In hi-fi you hear arguments that bits are bits and all the digital signals are the same is a poor argument because you're only having this one side of things. Digital signal is only perfect when the timing is perfect, but in a real signal it never is. And the deviation in timing is cheater. Whether you hear the difference or not, the cheater is always there. In this illustration, the cheater would be a shift in the location of the vertical lines, the sampling points. So you can imagine, for example, when this blue circle is now spot on at 11, if the sampling point would be shifted enough to the left, it would actually get value 10. So you can think that because of the cheater, the, the data gets wrong values. And of course, normally this is very small, and if it's random, it just becomes like noise. But jitter can also have systematic components if there's something wrong with the system and, and it can become like its own signal as a sine wave tone. Okay, let's have a look at the real world PCM signal. We need three physical signals. First is the pulse coded data we looked at already. Then is the bit clock that tells where the data bits are. And war clock that tells which of those bits belong to left and right channel. And it can look something like this. These signals go by many names. I use the bit clock, word clock, data. Even if it's different names, you can guess what they are when you know what, what needs to be there. And especially converters, they usually need a master clock as well. And this signal shown here is I2S, which is the most common format for PCM signal. Um, many call it I2S, squared I call I2S. It's a simple format in a way that the, the number of data bits can be anything because you have the word clocks showing where the channels are so you can just add zeros or cut it if needed. So because of this, the data is usually presented in 32 bits even if you have actual data, 24 bits. So the last 8 bits are just zeros. This gives the most common data rate and bit clock. When you have 32 bits, 48 kilohertz, you get 3.072 megahertz bit clock. And the most common master clock is 24.576 megahertz. And it's important to note these integer relations of the clock. So if you have a sample rate 48 kilohertz, bit clock is 64 times the sample rate because you have 32 bits per channel, two channels. And then master clock is 512 times the sample rate, or it can be 256 times or whatever, but there is the integer relation. And that's what most ADCs and DACs need, that the master clock also needs to be in sync with the rest of the clocks. And then if you have a brief look at the DST physical signal, so like PCM, we need a bit clock that gives the sampling points for the data. So basically rising or falling edge, you sample the data and you have one data stream per channel. So for stereo, stereo DSD, you would have one clock and two data streams. This illustration, you could think of the, the blue areas to be ones, white zeros, and the black lines in between would be the bit clock tells where the sampling points are. And like with PCM, you usually have a master clock for the ADCs and DACs as well. DSD64 was the first one for the SACD, but now you have these higher rates as well, so the number tells the oversampling ratio. And by definition, you can get an analog signal by just low pass filtering the DSD data. Of course, the reality is that you don't get a great performance by doing just a simple low pass filter. You need a high order filter or a proper DA converter to get the best performance. Okay, then something different. I2S and DSD are only for short distances between chips. They're not suitable for connections between devices. You need to have the data and multiple clocks. You need to transfer them in separate high-speed interconnects. There is no impedance control as it is. SPDIF was invented and it combines the clock and data in one coded signal. 
and this is suitable for longer connections. There are multiple types, as we know, it can be just a common RCA 75 ohms or BNC for a bit better signal integrity. And then we have TOSLINK, which is the plastic optical cable, and also 110 ohm XLR. It is usually called AES, but it's the same signal as SPD, just higher voltage level, and there may be some different bits coded inside the signal, but they, they work interchangeably. And of course, these days we do have I2S over HDMI, but this is not a standard. There are multiple pinouts and it's a total rabbit hole if you try to design something that uses I2S over HDMI. Of course, it could have been doable to use a, a multi-channel high-speed connector like we have these days. But SPDIF was created in the 80s. Back then, probably the only multi-channel connector we had was a SCART. So good luck transferring I2S over a SCART connector. Okay, let's have a look how we can take SPDIF input to a DAC. As said before, the SPDIF signal consists of the clock and data which are combined into one bit stream. And then we need an SPDIF receiver. And the receiver needs to extract the clock from the incoming bit stream. So we need something called PLL to lock into the incoming signal and recover all these PCM clocks and the data from this single bit stream. The fundamental problem here is that we don't know what's the clock rate of this incoming signal. We don't know the nominal clock rate and we also don't know what is the exact rate of the signal. So we need something that is flexible here that can lock into any kind of signal within, within some limits. And this works fine. This, this, this is the standard solution, has been for a long time, was for a long time, even for the highest, highest end of devices. So one feature of PLL is that it can remove excess cheater from the signal but it always has some inherent cheater of its own, so it's never optimal solution. So how can we improve this clocking? Because of how the SPDIF receiver works, it needs to clock into the incoming clocks. It's always a PCM master, it provides the clocks to the DAC, which is a slave device. So what if we want to use this high quality oscillator to provide the clocking for the DAC, and it will be running at nominal 48 kilohertz. But now the SPDIF signal coming in, it's slightly different. It's always going to be slightly different because two clock domains are never the same. This will cause some issues because they're slowly drifting relative to one another. So you may end up sampling one sample twice or miss a sample or just cause some nasty clocking glitches. So the only way this to work is that the duct just runs at whatever rate is coming in. Again, this is not a problem if the rate is slightly different. So here the deal is we have one clock domain, it's not a problem, but how can we use two clock domains? One option is sample rate converter. So now we have the same situation here. We have the SPDIF signal coming in and we have the duck here. We want to clock with this high quality oscillator and we need something in between to combine these two clock domains and sample rate converter does what it says. It connects two clock domains together by using two reference clocks and calculating new samples. It can also switch direction like master slave, two masters, two slaves. It is a very versatile device to have, but there's a big but. Hardware sample rate converter irreversibly changes the data. It takes in two reference clocks to calculate the new samples, and these are real signals, the clocks, so they have their own cheater, they're not never exactly accurate. And the new data is calculated based on these clocks, so you can just never get it back what you lose here. Both clock domains need to be very high quality, but then again, this doesn't really remove the problem, because we, st we still rely on the poor quality clock side as well. A sample rate converters are something where software solution is very good because when you do a software sample rate conversion, your clocks are ideal. You don't have a clock when you are converting the data, you just convert it with the nominal clock values. But whenever you have a hardware running at fixed sample rate, like basically any DSP, they need to have a hardware sample rate converter to just support a wide range of sample rates. Okay, next possible solution, reclocking. So the idea here is that we have this high quality oscillator, we use it to, to clock the duck and we use it also to re-clock the incoming clocks. We basically give the clock edges which have this cheater, we give them new edges. However, we still have two clock domains. 
there are some tricks we can do here, but the pro the fundamental problem is the same. We, if we just reclock directly with a different clock domain, we're gonna get glitches. It, it won't change it. So one solution to fix it then is to add a buffer. So you basically take the data in, hold it for a while, and then you reclock it. And this does solve the problem in some ways. Well, you're really just buying time by adding a buffer. You still have two clock domains. Eventually you will have under or overflow. So the buffer length here is critical. If you make it long enough, this works. How some reclockers do it, you have a, a control. You're basically measuring the average clock rate. You're controlling your oscillator to make it adjust for your incoming clocks. But then you're not having this high quality stable oscillator anymore. Of course, just worth mentioning here that we are kind of talking about a problem that doesn't exist. You could just use the SPDIF as said in the beginning and just don't worry about it. There has been some blind tests and you can also try it yourself. There are cheater test tracks online and according to some articles, the cheater needs to be very, very bad to be audible. But of course, we're audio files and engineers. We don't believe that kind of stuff. We want to make things very complicated. And of course, it's, it's nice to aim for the best reasonable solution we can. Okay, this is the last topic here. It kind of nicely wraps everything together. USB audio. So we have the same dock here. We have the nice good quality oscillator. And then we have a host or computer that is providing the USB audio for us. And in between, in, inside the audio equipment, we have the USB IC that takes the USB data in and it's clocked by this high quality oscillator. So what's the difference now? The difference is how the data is transferred. It's coming asynchronously. USB audio is not real time. So the data is coming in packets and when it's not real time, there is no clock signal per se and there is no cheater. There are no issues in the clock. So the USB IC, it asks for the data from the host. It transfers in packets it's buffered inside the IC and it clocks out by this high quality clock. So we actually have here, now what we talked before, there is a buffer, there is reclocking, and there is adjusting the data rate that we don't have any under or overflows. Of course, nothing comes without any drawbacks. There may be some noise and interference coming from the host or computer. Any kind of USB device is more or less a computer. And we also may not want to connect any type of computer in our audio kit. Okay, finally, let's try to draw some conclusions. Which one is the best? Any, really. I've only tried to present the concepts of these different things here, and the devil is in the detail. Implementation is everything. PCM or DSD can be equally good or bad. It's just a, a way of represent data. And USB is the best interface on paper, but as mentioned, computers may bring some additional issues in the audio setup. And I happily use this SPDIF directly without any complications. And reclocking with buffer can work really well when done right. So the purpose of all this was just to provide the concepts, hopefully educating. You can ask the right questions, discuss. Engineering all these solutions can be very interesting and rewarding. But just please don't take it too seriously. It's only audio. So I just want to wish you happy listening, happy engineering. Thanks for watching. And please subscribe if you're interested in seeing more content like this. Thank you.